I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. Okay, so he challenges our country. And he says, I want to see us put somebody on the moon, a man on the moon by 1970, and this is 1962. So we're talking about he's got seven and a half years. He wants NASA to accomplish this goal. What happens to this president six months or a year and a half later? He gets assassinated in Austin, Texas. In, in Dallas, Texas. Dallas. Yep, you're absolutely right. He gets assassinated on uh, November 22, 1963 in Dallas, Texas. And you know, this is kind of an American tradition, but when something like this happens to a great leader, especially a president, people look back at things that that president said and they try to enact those things. So NASA took this on personally as a challenge. We're gonna get somebody to the moon by 1970. And they went all out to do that, make that happen. So you can't just say, oh, we're going to build a rocket, we're going to send something to the moon and come back. There's a lot of physics, a lot of science involved with this. And so the goal was to successfully put humans in orbit around the Earth. Just make Project Mercury is all about this. Just get a guy in a space capsule, put him around here like this, and make, and, and really important, get him back to Earth safely. We don't want him dying, okay? We don't want any, any deaths here. So that was from 1961 to 63. There were seven missions, seven different astronauts. I think one astronaut, Deke Slayton, didn't actually uh, fly, so there may have only been six. Uh, single astronaut, the first flight, it didn't even get into space. It was just this. That's all. No orbit. The second flight uh, was kind of uh, uh, a wake-up call for all of us. One of the Parts of the process was when the space capsule came back down to Earth, it would parachute and land in the ocean. A helicopter would come out and pick that whole capsule up. And uh, sometimes they would have scuba divers who would jump in and get the astronaut out first. Well, the second one sank. And they were able to get, uh, I think it was Gus Grissom, they were able to get him out before the capsule sunk. Here's the best part of the story. That capsule sat on the bottom of the ocean for about 35, 40 years. It's now in the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. So it's pretty crusty looking because it laid there a long time. Uh, third flight, three successful orbits around the Earth, John Glenn. He's probably one of our most famous astronauts. The last flight was a total of seven times around the Earth. That only took about 22 hours. But you had this astronaut had to sit in there for 22 hours as he went around the Earth. It gets pretty uncomfortable. If you've ever been on an airline flight for three or four hours, imagine 22 hours. Can't move. Here's John Glenn up here in this thing, that black capsule at the top. Right up there, he's right up in this part. This was also the first time they had a camera inside the capsule. You'll see a picture of him here in a second. That suit doesn't look real comfortable, does it? No, that much. Okay, Project Gemini was the next phase. Now we want to try to take two astronauts up in the same capsule and kind of do some acrobatics with it. Can you turn it around? Can you, can you get somebody to open the hatch, step out, float around, come back in? If you ever saw the movie Gravity, you may have seen uh, people doing that outside that space shuttle. Two astronauts, first spacewalk. So here's the first guy, first American, getting outside and going for a, a spacewalk. See the earth in the background? Does he look like he's going over 17,000 miles an hour? No, he doesn't. Does he look like he's walking? No, he's floating. Okay, but we called it a spacewalk. 
let's see, Project Apollo went from 1967 to 1972. Now we're going to actually go all the way to the moon. There were 17 missions, only the last seven went to the moon. Apollo 1, we had our first loss of life. Three astronauts were rehearsing inside the capsule. It was pressurized with pure oxygen. Pure oxygen is highly flammable. A tiny spark underneath one of the seats of the astronauts sparked that fire and all three men perished. So those were our first losses and our first um, three heroes to die. And they weren't even in space. Apollo 8 through 10, they went all the way out to the moon, orbited the moon, but never set foot on the moon, and flew back and landed. That'd be like taking you to the cafeteria at lunchtime, but you can't eat. <laughs> all you can do is walk through, okay? So I would have been really frustrated, I think. I'm, beautiful views of the uh, moon, but not so much. Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, first man to set foot on the, the moon. Apollo 13, you may have seen this movie, Houston, We Have a Problem where they had an explosion on board and had to limp their way back to Earth. Tremendous uh, time for NASA to problem solve. Apollo 15 through 17, they actually landed that one and had a uh, lunar rover, which was like a ATV, all-terrain vehicle, you know, zipping around on the moon, checking things out. But here's a picture uh, taken out the window. It's not a very good one, because 1969, they weren't really good at the photography. And if you'll go ahead and click that, Mr. McMahon, the, uh, uh, you'll see what the landing kind of looked like out the tiny window. There's a shadow. Now a couple hours later. Here's the astronaut. <coughs> That's one small step for man, one giant, giant leap for mankind. First person to ever do this. Okay, then we had Skylab. That was a big, huge thing, as you can see over there. Did all kinds of experiments in space, stayed up for a number of years, uh, do space experiments, and, and do a lot of with gravity or lack of gravity. Launched in 73, returned to the Earth in 1979. I think it landed or crashed somewhere off of Australia. The space shuttle, which is what you're going to be involved in, it really started in 1981. Present is really not true anymore. Uh, it's been a, a few years since uh, the program stopped. First reusable spacecraft. It was very expensive to send rockets to the moon because you threw everything away. Couldn't salvage anything. The space shuttle was a rocket, acted as a rocket, then as a spacecraft, and then a glider when it came back to Earth. We did have shuttle disasters. We lost human lives. 1986, when the Challenger lifted off, it exploded uh, a minute and 11 seconds into flight. And then in 2003, when Columbia was re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, it uh, disintegrated uh, because of tile issues on the bottom of the uh, space shuttle. Here's a picture of one. Uh, before we start it, just remember, be, be real thoughtful of this when we play it, because you're, gonna, you're not going to actually see, you're going to see an explosion, but seven people, is that right, seven? Seven people died immediately from this. Okay, go ahead, Mr. McMahon. Those are the solid rocket boosters that are going off just on their own. They don't have any control over them at that point. 
Seven heroes right there. Seven people willing to risk their life to take chances to explore and learn new things about space. And towards the end here, you know, every time they landed, uh, they liked to land back at the Cape in Florida, but if they couldn't, sometimes they had, because of rain or bad weather, they would land in California sometimes. And how do you get a big space shuttle back to the Cape? You put it on top of a 747 jet. <coughs> and it used to fly through Tucson, or over Tucson, and if you were down there and if the weather was nice, you could spot this thing because it was big. But that was really, really an awkward looking thing, but really cool by the same token. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna turn things over to Mr. Jim Kennedy. And uh, I want you to know that everything you saw here, he lived through that. He grew up in that area. And I wanted his job. <laughs> but uh, he's a real hero to me because he, he's all about teamwork and he's gonna come inspire you about the future of space. Thank you for the presentation. And I also have to say to the students, I speak to 6,000 sixth graders every year back in Florida, and I have never seen a group more attentive, more respectful, more kind than the students right here today. So thank you for the way you treated Joe and the way I know you will treat me. It is an honor to be here. Okay, we're gonna talk about space exploration the program that I, where I speak to all 6,000 kids in Florida, it's entitled Inspiring the Next Generation of Explorers. And I'll talk a little bit more about inspiration, but I think that is the single most important thing to help you succeed in life. So we'll talk more about that. We're going to talk about rockets. We're going to talk about astronauts. I met the Freemans on the cruise ship. By the way, you met Mr. Freeman. His wife, Ann, is back here. There's a picture of Joe and Ann Freeman from Mesa, Arizona. We met them on a cruise ship. And Mr. Freeman said, if you ever get to Phoenix, I'd sure like you to come speak to one of our schools. So here we are today for that reason, and we're gonna talk about space exploration. We'll start with a one minute video. You'll see in just a moment, there's a countdown clock. In Florida at the Kennedy Space Center, we live and die by countdown clocks. So when this video starts, you'll see one right over there. It's T minus 57 seconds and counting. I'll kind of narrate this video for about a minute. When the clock gets to T minus 10 seconds, if you will, help me count down to a shuttle launch, okay? When you see it on the screen, count 10, 9, 8. When you get to zero, the official word is liftoff. So there's a rocket called the Falcon 9. I'll talk more about that in a minute. But it's bringing a bunch of hardware and supplies to the International Space Station. The space station's been up there for 15 years. Somebody's lived aboard that nonstop for 15 years. There, anybody know what that is called? My favorite satellite in the world, the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble has taken a million pictures and, and many, many more of beautiful things. You see the clock now when he gets to 10. Raise the roof with me. Help me with 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Lift off. Woo! Good job, guys. I suspect when you woke up this morning, you didn't know you'd be launching a space shuttle. But you did. And now you are all honorary launch directors, and I should have brought this up, but I forgot this too. I have one of these for every student. This makes you an honorary launch director for NASA, and we'll give those out when this is all over. So, here we go. I mentioned Hubble Space Telescope. I want to bring this to you, because I want to give you a rose. It's kind of close to Mother's Day. I'd like to give you something. So I'm going to give you this rose. It's called the Rose of Galaxies. Hubble Space Telescope looked deep in space on its 21st birthday, they picked out this, that's a, a galaxy right there. That stem, what looks like the stem of the rose, is another galaxy, so they called it the Rose of Galaxies. You know how far those galaxies are? Light travels 186,000 miles per second. It's 300 million light years away. Light would have to travel for 300 million years to get out there to where they are. So that's called the Rose of Galaxies. It's my favorite picture probably ever taken of space. Did you know we're on a collision course with another galaxy? What is our galaxy called? The Milky Way. We're on a collision course with Andromeda. 
So the scientists have a big advantage to be able to look deep in space and see what happens when galaxies collide. Because that's actually, you can see it bending there, that's actually colliding with that galaxy. So we will collide one day with Andromeda, but we don't have any idea what to expect and it's not for millions and millions of years. So don't worry about it. But I like to show pretty pictures and then bring up some words. So let me bring up some words here. Welcome to Falcon Hell Elementary uh, sixth graders. It is an honor to be with you today. And I, I was able to cut and paste your, uh, your logo, the home of the Firebirds. You guys are probably about to no longer be Firebirds, right? Because you're about to graduate. But that's just my way of saying welcome. Now, this is another one of the slides I just love. This is a female astronaut. I'm proud to tell the girls and the boys there is nothing in this world that girls can't do. When I was your age, the space business was almost all men. It's not that way at all anymore. It's men and women. That's a woman inside that spacesuit. She's up above the atmosphere, right? The atmosphere goes about 100 miles. She's up 250 miles going to work on the space station, which is out where you are. It's reflecting beautifully on her helmet. So she's up above the atmosphere. The reason it reflects so beautifully, by the way, is because when you're above the atmosphere, the sun's rays can blind you. And so they have, NASA has to paint the inside of that rounded helmet with gold paint. And that protects her eyes, but at the same time, it makes for a beautiful reflective image. So that's what that picture is all about. Now, let me use that as a backdrop to tell you for the next 30 minutes or so, I hope you continue to have fun as you did uh, with Mr. Freeman. Having fun is an important part of school because I think it helps you learn. And I've got a lot of material for you. My favorite one is I hope you get inspired a little bit. I'm not going to offer but a little bit of inspiration. Your teachers, to their credit, they do it for you each and every day. Your parents offer inspiration, your friends. I think that is so important. To me, it's like the fire burning in your belly that makes you want to be the best person you can be. So I hope you get a little inspiration from this presentation today. Every time I travel on cruise ships or with my sixth grade students, I have various trivia questions. Let me ask you this one. What color are the flags? Mr. Freeman mentioned that we landed on the moon six times. Every time the commander, that happens to be Commander John Young from Orlando, Florida, when he, before he left the moon, he planted his flag. Only America has ever been to the moon with people. No other country has ever done it. So the question is, raise your hand if you think you know the answer. What color are the flags on the moon today? Yes, sir. Red, Red white, and blue. That is such an obvious guess. And I'm going to give you credit because you're partially right. They're actually white. Look at the flag. What happened? There's no atmosphere on the moon. Remember we talked about the astronaut's eyes get burned because she's up above the atmosphere. On the moon, there's no atmosphere. So for 40 some odd years, the sun has been bleaching the flags and it's turned them totally white. So that's just a little trivia question. I'd like to invite you all to visit us at Kennedy Space Center. I don't know if your families might be taking a vacation to Florida this year, but if you do, this is a chance to be nose to nose with Space Shuttle Atlantis. That is an actual picture of what you get to see when you walk into the museum where we have Atlantis on display. It is, it'll be a great thing. And I'm going to give your teachers my contact information. If any of you ever get to Florida, don't hesitate to give me a call or send me an email. I'd love to help you if I can. Now, Mr. Freeman talked about the space shuttle. There's the very first space shuttle launch. You see that big white thing right there? That's called the external tank. It kind of looks like that before they painted it white. It's hydrogen. To start a fire, you always have to have a fuel and an oxidizer, right? And then you start it with a spark, just like on rocket engines. The fuel is hydrogen. The oxidizer is oxygen. And we start the fire that goes, comes out of these rocket engines. We start it with a spark. So we're feeding in hydrogen. Can I call it H2? And we feed in an oxidizer. Oh, oxygen. Can I call it O? Wait a minute. H2O? to make a fire start in a rocket engine? Are you kidding me? H2O, it's water. What's coming out the back of that space shuttle rocket engine is nothing more than steam because the fuel is H2, the oxidizer is O. So you can actually make water burn with the right amount, the right uh, concentration of hydrogen and oxygen. So I want to ask you to ask me a question. Sometimes I like to plant questions. So when we ask you for questions in a few minutes, you'll, you'll go blank maybe. <laughs> Let me give you an idea. We stopped painting that big old tank white, and it, for the rest of the missions, 133 missions, it was not white. It was kind of that brown, orange color. Somebody may want to ask me, why did you stop painting those tanks? We only painted two tanks white. So wait till the Q&A. I would love to have somebody ask that question, or if you know the answer, I would even more like to have you answer it. So remember that question, if you will. 
Without the space shuttle, we never could have built the International Space Station. That station is up there in space right now, traveling around the world, around the Earth, one time every 90 minutes. About the amount of time we'll be with you today, it makes one complete lap around the Earth, traveling at five miles per second. It's been up there for, wait a minute, it just had a birthday. How old is it? It's 15 years older than any of the students in this room. It's 15 years it's been up there with somebody living on board the space station. They do a whole lot of things. By the way, it's about the size of a football field and it weighs like a million pounds, but it weighs a million pounds on Earth. I wonder, what does it weigh up in space in zero G? Zero. Yeah, you multiply the mass, a million pounds of mass times zero G, then the weight is zero in space. But anyway, a lot of research is going on in the station. Let me just tell you about the one that I think is most important. And here's something that I want you to remember. My generation never made it to Mars with people. We've made it with robots. You've seen curiosity and spirit and opportunity. We've never made people to Mars, and I don't think in my lifetime we will. In your generation, we will. But to get you there, if, if you're in space, it's very hard on your body. And let me just talk about a bone. This is true of every bone in your body, but I'll just point to that one. And when you stay in space for six months, even though you eat a really good diet and you exercise very regularly, you still lose 10% of your bone mass every six months. When you guys go to Mars, guess how long it will take you? It's a three-year mission to Mars and back. Now, here's another idea for a question. I can get you to Mars in seven months. Well, how come it's not just 14 months to get you to Mars and back? That may be a question for you. I don't know. But it is a three-year mission to get you to Mars and back, and the body can't stand that right now. So what the astronauts are doing is a lot of research uh, for the body. They exercise three hours every day. They ride bicycles, they lift weights, and they run on a treadmill. And I'm going to tell you two stories at the end of my time today. It's one about a lady who ran on that treadmill. But anyway, three hours every day they exercise to try and help us understand what can we do to let your generation travel for three years in space. We just can't do it right now for sure. So when the shuttle retired, we had to come up with new rockets. This is a pretty picture of a Falcon 9 launch. The company that made it is called SpaceX. Maybe you heard about it. I wanted to show you this launch because this is really a big deal. The whole time since I was your age, and I've been in the rocket business ever since I was your age, it's too expensive to travel to space because the rocket goes up. The first stage separates, and what does it do? It falls back in the ocean. It sinks to the bottom of the ocean, like $20 million worth of rocket gone. Well, this guy, the guy who owns the SpaceX company, his name is Elon Musk from South Africa. Guess what he figured out? That is the rocket you just saw lift off. Okay, let me simulate it for you. So his rocket took off heading for space. Five minutes later, the rocket finished its mission. It would have fallen back in the ocean. Instead, he found a way to reignite that rocket engine, fly it back to the Kennedy Space Center, and land it. And that's what's going on. That picture is such an iconic image. That's the rocket that you just saw lift off flew itself back to Kennedy Space Center and landed just to be reused. So we're no longer throwing away millions of dollars worth of rockets every time. And I put that little arrow so you make sure you know that's actually coming down. And what the rocket engine's doing is allow it to come down in a very controlled fashion and sit down gently at the launch pad. So that's kind of a big deal. Now, just to make the point that rockets, Joe talked about some of the failures we've had. Let me show you a different look of a failure. There's a rocket up in Virginia. This is not launched at Kennedy Space Center. This one's launched in Virginia. It's called the Antares rocket, a beautiful early morning sunrise, the water tower. That's what it looked like at T minus one. You remember you counted down to T zero. Well, at one second before launch, it looked like that. Let me show you what it looked like at T plus one. So the countdown clock gets to zero, and then they start counting back up. Plus one second, two seconds, three. At one second, poof, holy catfish. Something went terribly wrong with that rocket engine, and the whole thing blew up, and it was like that high off the launch pad. So it leveled the launch pad. We don't even have a launch pad up there anymore. It blew it to smithereens. So that's the only reason I like to show that picture is so you begin to have an appreciation that rocketry can be kind of a dangerous business. Nobody was hurt in that, by the way. I'm thankful to tell you they weren't trying to launch people to space. They were trying to launch cargo. Now, what about launching people to space? As Mr. Freeman said, when we stopped flying the shuttle, we had no other way to launch people to space. So for the last uh, four years, we've had to fly our astronauts to Russia 
and Russia takes them to space station and brings them home. Well, I'm happy to tell you in just a little over a year, we will be launching that rocket. You see the windows in there? That's kind of a telltale sign that there's people riding aboard that baby. And Boeing has one called the Starliner. Both of those are going to be launching at Kennedy Space Center to take our astronauts back to space. Kind of a big deal because we love our friends, the Russians, but you just kind of don't want to be totally dependent upon another country. Let me show you this one picture. We're so close to launching people finally again that they've named these four astronauts. They'll fly on the very first mission in 2017. I just wanted you to know, I'm gonna tell you a story in a few minutes about that girl. I just wanted to plant the seed. She'll be the first girl to ever fly on the new rockets. Her name is Sunny Williams. By the time we leave today, you will never ever forget the name Sunny Williams. I think I can promise that. So let's talk about the rocket that's gonna take you guys, no joke, you guys, to Mars and back to the moon. It's called the Space Launch System. You know what acronyms are? Where you just take the first letter, Space Launch System. So we call it SLS for short. So that's the SLS. The biggest rocket that has ever been built and flown in the world. So you will be riding right up there in a little spacecraft, not little really, looks little on that big old picture, a spacecraft called Orion. Let me show you a closer look. That's the Orion spacecraft. It will have six students from Falcon Hell Elementary, if you so choose to fly you where? Back to the moon. We haven't been there since I was like 20 years old. And on to Mars, it'll take six of you. And you remember I told you how proud I am of women. I just love that women can do anything that a man can do. Bam, oh, look at that. Charlie Blackwell Thompson was just picked as the first launch director for that rocket. And in a couple of years, she's gonna have 3,000 people working for her as we launch that rocket from the Kennedy Space Center. First time we've ever had a woman launch director. How silly is that? Why do we wait so long? I can't explain it, but I'm glad that we now have Charlie and that will take your generation onto the moon and onto Mars. Now let's talk a little bit about the universe. I think the universe is almost 14 billion years old. Talk to your parents and make sure that, that you agree and they agree. I think it's that old. You know how big a billion is, right? You take a million, you multiply it by what to get a billion? thousand a million times a thousand to get to a billion kind of want to set that in your mind because this chart has a lot of that b word a lot of billions so i think it's 13.7 billion years old but i know everybody doesn't agree so i just want to tell you to talk to your your parents i think we all agree that the universe consists of billions of galaxies and a galaxy is a gigantic cluster of solar systems every galaxy has billions of stars and what's another name for a star? A sun. You guys are the best. You are the best. The sun. So our solar system has how many stars? Uno. One. It's our sun. So let's get closer at home. I can't remember. The name of our galaxy is, um, oh yeah, the Milky Way. They think our galaxy alone has 400 billion stars, of which our entire solar system is only one of those 400 billion stars. So the, gal the uh, universe is certainly a big old thing. Let me just show you a couple of things in our solar system that I think you might want to know about. Let's start with the sun, which my grandson is convinced it's the most amazing heavenly body in the world. And I think he tends to be right. We sent a satellite up five years ago to take pictures. It's been orbiting the sun every second for five years. It takes another picture. That's a real picture of your sun. A couple things I want to tell you. You remember what the fuel was that keeps those rocket engines burning? Yeah. Hydrogen. Would you believe the sun burns exactly the same thing? The sun burns hydrogen. So get this, the sun is really big, right? A million miles in diameter. You know how, well, first of all, you know how hot the sun is? At the core, it's 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. But more importantly, you know how much hydrogen it takes to keep the sun burning? because it's a million miles in diameter, right? Takes a lot of fuel, just like when you go for a ride in your car. You go for a ride in your car, you're using up fuel. So guess how much hydrogen the sun is burning every second? 1.2 trillion, and a trillion is a billion times a thousand. Over a trillion pounds of hydrogen burn every single second. So what happens when you take your car for a long drive? You might eventually run out of yeah. gas. Well, guess what's gonna happen to our sun? it will eventually run out of fuel, which is hydrogen. 
So the sun is going to die, and we can't live without the sun, but the last thing I ever want to do is scare a sixth grader. So let me assure you, we're talking not tomorrow. We're talking four and a half billion years from now, the sun may burn out. Well, the sun will definitely burn out. They think it's about four and a half billion years. So if anybody ever says, Jim, why do you care so much about launching people to space? We have to learn how to do this because one day before the sun dies, because we can't live without the sun, right? Before the sun dies, we have to learn how to launch people to space and take them to another Earth-like planet. The good news is they have found hundreds of Earth-like planets. So we will have to leave our solar system one day. We'll have to to find a new, a new sun a new Earth-like planet. And I just kind of want to tell you that. Had to show you this picture. Joe mentioned Apollo 8. It arrived at the moon. First time people ever went to the moon. They went around the, around the moon. They came back. They saw the Earth in the, in the far ground. They saw the moon up close. And that was on Christmas Eve of 1968. They read from the book of Genesis and the Bible. It was the most inspirational night I think I've ever had. Now, let's show you maybe one more thing about a planet in our solar system. Maybe you guys heard this. This is big news. Big news. It just happened September of last year, maybe eight or nine months ago. We have a satellite orbiting around Mars. They look down at the equator. Did you know Mars is the only other planet that has an ap a, a, a season, like summer, winter, fall, and spring? Earth has seasons, and Mars has seasons. No other planet does. Well, down at the equator of Mars, where it's the hottest, and during the summer, when it's the hottest on Mars, they look down, guess what that is? That's a river of water flowing on Mars. And even though Mars is so far from the sun, it's 34 million miles farther than we are from the sun, at the equator during the summer, the water melts and it can flow. And the temperature is like 72 degrees outside, a little bit cooler than it is today here in, in Mesa, Arizona. So that's kind of a big discovery because once you have water, Water is a fundamental building block to life. And they may find life on Mars. Who knows? They haven't found it yet, but they have the ability to for sure. I'm going to change gears and talk about NASA spinoffs, and then I'll get into some stories real quick for you. A NASA spinoff is when NASA develops a technology, then they say, wait a minute, we use that to get to space, but I think it can help everybody on planet Earth. Let me just show you a couple of them. Have you ever, what do you think that is right there? A heart. Well, you know the heart is a pump, right? It's a pump to pump blood. NASA took the pump that pumps hydrogen out of that big old rocket. It's this big. Dr. DeBakey in Houston, Texas found a way to scale that down to the size of a heart. That heart right now is keeping people alive using rocket pump technology. Kind of a big deal. Let me just tell you one more. Have you ever had one of those on your finger? The reason NASA wanted that is that every time an astronaut exercised, they would have to take a little needle and put a hole in their skin and squeeze out blood, put the blood on a piece of glass, analyze it. The next day they'd say, okay, your oxygen level yesterday was 98% or whatever. NASA used a technology that's kind of like an x-ray, you know, where you look th right through your body and see your bones and things. They have this technology that can look right through your finger into the blood flowing through the, your fingertip and read out the oxygen level. That one's 98%. So let me just stop there. Those are just two, but NASA's had 50,000 of these technologies and they all make our life better. So it's not just about putting people in space, it's about making life better for us. You ever heard of photosynthesis? Yeah, yeah. photosynthesis is where the sun bakes into a plant, a tree or a plant. The plant takes in water and it takes in carbon dioxide, right? We breathe out carbon dioxide. The idea is we're going to have plants in space to keep people alive. Let me show you this little video. That's Scott Kelly. His brother lives down south in Tucson. What are they doing? They're eating the very first lettuce that's ever been grown in space. So that little 15 second video is kind of a big deal. They grew food and then they turned around and ate it. Why is that important? When you guys go to Mars for a three-year mission, we can't send enough beanie weenies to keep you fed. So we're going to have to learn to grow food in space. They did it right there. And when you grow food, you're not just producing something you can eat, but you're cleaning out the carbon dioxide and you're generating oxygen. So you will see an awful lot about photosynthesis in the coming years. I just wanted to mention that. I'm ready for my stories, but before I tell you my story, have you ever heard of story time from space? Good. I want to be the one to tell you about it. What the astronauts do, they float up into, this is called the cupola. It's on the bottom side of the space station looking down at planet Earth. 
the astronauts love to float up into the cupola and read a book to you. If you Google story time from space, and I'll leave a copy of my slides with you, we'll just cut and paste it to your desktop maybe, you can go on there, it's real simple. I, I, I did this with my granddaughter just a week ago. The astronauts will read these books from the cupola. So you have a beautiful view behind them. They're reading you a really cool story, story time from space. You have to check it out. Now let me tell you my stories. I'm gonna leave one of these for each of your teachers. I have 52 stories that are published into a DVD and I'm gonna leave one of the DVDs uh, with your school so you can look at it if you want to. What I have is 52 stories of space. The stories are all true, number one. I don't make these up. And they teach you a valuable lesson in life. By the way, your school has valuable lessons in life plastered all over the walls and I have been so inspired. Right outside this door is one about being respectful of others. Boy, do you live that to, to the hilt. Everybody I've seen in this school has been so respectful of others. But that's a value, be respectful of others. I have, all of my stories demonstrate these values uh, and they're on the DVD to see later, but I'm gonna only take the time to tell you two. The tip number five has a story with it. It says, go the extra mile. Go the extra mile to me means do more than you have to do. Don't always just do the minimum. Go the extra mile. And I'll tell you a story about an astronaut named Sonny Williams who went the extra mile. The second story I'm going to tell you comes from tip number 10. Be proud of who you are. I got a feeling you guys are already proud of who you are. I see it in your eyes. I see it in your behavior. I'm going to tell you about a young man who went to Iraq. He came back devastated, but he was still proud of who he is. So those are my two stories I'm going to tell you. Let's start with go the extra mile. Again, it means do more than you have to do, okay? I'll tell you what an astronaut did as a favor to a young sixth grade girl, by the way. Here's the story. Her name is Sunny Williams. You remember I mentioned she's the girl that's going to fly when that new rocket flies in a year and a half. Well, Sunny Williams was going to be her first mission to the space station. She was going to go up, spend six months orbiting the Earth on the space station, then come home. That was going to be my last mission before I retired. This was all nine years ago. So anyway, the story is about Sunny Williams, but before I tell you the story of her, let me tell you what happened seven days before I launched Sunny Williams to space. I was asked to go over to Orlando, Florida to commission them with this special award. It's called the NASA Explorer School. I drove up into their driveway. When I parked my car, I got out. This young lady came to greet me. By the way, that's me. Now, do you recognize me? <laughs> this young lady came out to my car to greet me and she said, welcome, Mr. Kennedy. My name is Sonny and I'm going to be your hostess today. And I said, Sonny, that's interesting. Did you know there's a girl named Sonny, astronaut, who's going to go to space in one week? Now, I didn't mention anything about Williams. I just used first names, right? Well, that's not a big coincidence, but Sonny thought it was a big deal. And the whole time I was at her school, she went around telling everybody, guess what? There's an astronaut named Sonny, just like me, and she's going to space in a week. And she was so excited. So after three hours of working at her school, I went with Sonny, walked me to my car. We shook hands one more time. I said, Sonny, thank you for being my hostess. And she said, you're welcome. And then it dawned on me, we never even talked last names. And I said, Sonny, what is your last name? She said, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Sonny Williams. Hello, <laughs> now we have a real coincidence. So I immediately said, Sonny, you have got to be my guest. So this Sonny was gonna fly one week from the day I met little Sonny. So she came over a week later, by the way. My wife, Bernie, was her uh, hostess. And we can talk more about Sonny maybe during your questions. But let me tell you the rest of the story. So a little girl named Sonny who's gonna go watch big Sonny Williams fly. Here's what happened. Four days after I met little Sonny, which was three days before the launch, right? All the astronauts on that mission flew in. There's Sonny, there's me greeting Sonny, there's her plane, they all live in Houston, Texas. She flew from Houston to Kennedy Space Center. They found that picture, I don't know how, of me greeting Sonny and here's how the conversation went. Remember the tip is go the extra mile. First thing I said to Sonny is, you're not gonna believe this, Sonny, but there's a little sixth grade girl named Sonny Williams who's gonna be in the audience sitting right next to the river, as close as anybody could be to her launch and she's gonna be here in three days when you fly. Sonny said, whoa, I'm excited. She reached up and you know, that's a name tag held on with Velcro. First thing she did is she said, I wanna do something for Sonny, what can I do? She ripped off her name tag that said Sonny Williams and said, Jim, would you give her my name tag? That's kinda of cool if your name was the same as an astronaut. So I said, yes, I will. And then, but that's not the end of it. Then I said, Sonny, do you think you, you're gonna be up there for six months orbiting the earth. Do you think you could send her an email? 
would that be kind of cool to get an email from somebody by the same name in space saying, good morning, Sonny Williams from space. She said, I'd be happy to just get me her email address. But the zinger is next. I thought I had hit pay dirt. She was going to get a name tag. She was going to get an email. I was leaving Sonny Williams to go greet the next astronaut when she said, Jim, hang on. I'd like to go the extra mile, quote unquote. I said, Sonny, I think you already have. What are you talking about? I'd like to go the extra mile. If you can find out her telephone number and her birthday, I would like to call her from space and wish her a happy birthday. Can you believe it? That's going the extra mile. She did not have to do that. My wife and I invited little Sonny over to our house for dinner about three or four years ago. She's now big Sonny. She is forevermore a different and better person because somebody went the extra mile for her. So I encourage you, go the extra mile anytime you can. There's Sonny flying three days later to space. She got to space and she, uh, she has a record, by the way. She has done more hours of spacewalking than any girl in the world. And she also ran the Boston Marathon in space. The cool thing is her sister ran it in Boston that day. So when they fired the gun to start her sister's race, the sound of the gun was uplinked, we call it, to the space station. Sonny heard the same gun just a fraction of a second later. She took off running the Boston Marathon. Sister on the ground, Sonny in space. So with that, I'm going to tell you my second and last story, and then it'll be time for questions for both me and Mr. Freeman. The tip on this one is teachers rock. Do you guys agree with me? Yes, I know you do. I have had the pleasure of meeting some of your teachers at this beautiful school. Teachers rock. They rock at this school as much as I have ever seen them rock. Let me start by telling, what's her name? Anybody remember? No, no, no. I can see why you'd say Sunny. It's actually Krista McAuliffe. She was a teacher that was selected to be the first teacher in space. And Mr. Freeman mentioned the, the tragic uh, Challenger disaster where we lost seven people. One of them was Krista. So we lost Krista being the first teacher in space. I loved her quote. She said, I touch the future because I teach. And your teachers touch the future every day through you because you are going to go live your life and their, and their values and their education is being reflected in you. So I love that picture and I would like to dedicate this to the teachers in the room who have dedicated their lives to teaching. We start with this. Have you guys ever heard of that man? You're a little bit young. His name is... Um, his name's so easy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Joe Freeman tell you his name. Um, I for, I, for some reason, I'm drawing a blank. Piers? Piers Morgan, Piers Morgan, he was on CNN. He was interviewing that man right there. You know who that man is right there? One of the world's richest men? Bill not Bill Gates, Bill Gates is the richest man. Donald Trump. No, not Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump. I'm leaving, I'm leaving. Now, can you tell me his name? Joe? Warren Buffett, one of the world's richest men. Piers Morgan was interviewing Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett Jr., Warren Buffett III, and he said, this is just to lead into the story, he said to Warren Buffett Sr., how would you like to be remembered? Here's the world's richest man. How would you like to be remembered? His answer was, I'd like to be remembered as a teacher. Whoa, when I saw this, I ran back to my office and I made a slide of that night's TV show because that's a big deal. The guy has everything in the world he most wants to be remembered as a teacher, which I think is kind of a big deal. Let me tell you about one of my teachers, Dr. Frank Swinson. He changed my life when I went to college. He literally changed my life. We invited him down to a, to a shuttle launch. You know what he's doing right there? He's touching the moon rock that we have at the Kennedy Space Center. If you'll come, you'll get to do it as well. Now, let me tell you the real story. This is all just kind of preamble to my real story. This is a story about a teacher, the difference a teacher can make in your life. We had an astronaut, his name was Pete Conrad. He was the commander of Apollo 12. So Apollo 11 is the one everybody remembers, right? Neil Armstrong. Three months later, Apollo 12 went to the moon. The commander was Pete Conrad, and that's Pete standing next to this spacecraft, which was a robotic spacecraft, no people aboard. NASA sent it up two years early to make sure that when we send Apollo 12 to the moon, it'll be safe. So Pete landed in that spacecraft right there. It landed, he got out and walked there for that picture. A real iconic image, by the way, in the space business. But let me tell you about Pete, and this is where a teacher gets involved. Pete was a high school dropout. Can, have you, can you imagine a high school dropout becoming the third, selected the third man to ever walk on the moon? You gotta be kidding me. 
The problem is Pete was dyslexic. And 60 years ago, they didn't know that much about it. But Pete thought he just didn't have enough smarts because all of his classmates could read better than he could. He quit school. He went down to the local airport and got a job. But a teacher, not unlike yours, by the way, his teacher's name was Mr. Hainiger. He, Mr. Hainiger went down to the airport every day and said, Pete, I've got to get you back in school. You've got so much potential. Don't throw it away by quitting school. A teacher wouldn't give up on him. He had given up on himself, but his teacher never did. So Mr. Hainiger convinced Pete to go back to school. Pete went back. He graduated with honors from high school. Mr. Hainiger got him a Naval scholarship at Princeton. He graduated with honors at Princeton. He joined NASA. He was the third man to walk on the moon. It would never have happened if a teacher not unlike yours didn't care enough about him to do what was best for him, talk him back into school. So that's kind of a big deal. I rest my case. I think teachers rock. And with that, I want to know, would you please help me thank your teachers? Hey, teachers and principals and district employees <laughs> to all of our teachers. Thank you. I have a little gift for the teachers. This is a lady that was my director of education at the Kennedy Space Center. We have that pen right there. I'll show you one of them. I won't take the time to do it now, but if all the teachers would please give me a chance to say thank you, I would love to give you a NASA pen as a reflection of our appreciation for what you have chosen to do with your career. So I'm almost finished. We talked, uh, Joe actually had that video where you heard uh, Neil Armstrong say the Eagle has landed, you remember? They named his spacecraft the Eagle. So as soon as his spacecraft landed, he said, the eagle has landed. So I titled this picture, The Eagle Has Landed, a beautiful picture taken by a friend of an eagle with the moon in the background. And I'd like to end this. We talked about inspiration. Let me end it like this. I believe that if you allow yourself to get inspired, and it takes your effort, nobody can give you inspiration. People can help you, but you have to get inspired on your own. If you can get inspired, I really believe you can soar with the eagles. You get yourself inspired, you will soar higher, you will go farther and faster than you've ever been before. But it starts with that fundamental inspiration that I know you're getting at this school. So we're gonna quit here. You are the nicest group of students, teachers, principals that I have ever met with. And I have the pleasure of meeting with a whole lot of sixth graders. You've got something really strong going on here. And I just wanna thank you for allowing Mr. Freeman and myself to come. So one of these for every student and I'll give them to your teacher. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Bye, guys. <laughs>